Hello and welcome back to the all new all different number one comics podcast episode number 64. Bob, we're 64 episodes old. We are. Uh, that makes us proper senior citizens or is it 67? When do you get social security is the real question. I don't know. We'll figure out in about 20 years. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> <laughs> oh. If social security is still a thing. Yeah. I mean, I would say at the very least, uh, you know, 25 years and even then, you know, we're probably pushing it. They're, yeah, they, they want to make sure people don't retire until they're like 90 now, I think, is, is the new cool thing. Anyways. Uh, don't make it that far. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we are the all-new, all-different, number one political podcast. <laughs> <laughs> the all-new, all-different, number one comics podcast, where each and every single week, uh, my co-host Bob and I say hello, Bob. Hello, Bob. Take a look at a brand new first issue comic book, break down the story and art, give it somewhat a review, and let you know if we think that you should move on to issue number two or not. We also talk a little bit of comic book news, and uh, more than a little bit exists this week is all I can say. And we talk about what's new in comic book shops this and next week. Bob, this week we're going to be taking a deep dive into the all-new number one. From Image Comics Redcoat. That's right, and it's it's like one of those weird things because, yeah, it's Image Comics. They're the one publishing it. But this is uh, – I don't know who is the owner of Ghost Machine, but uh, obviously Jeff Johns has like a big hand in it here since he wrote all three books that came out from Ghost Machine this week. But this is the proper launch of Ghost Machine. So would this be an Image slash Skybound kind of thing? I guess so. I mean, I guess you could call it an imprint is, is what I'm going to think of it as. Kind of, kind of like – you know, DC had their imprints. Yeah, Wildstorm and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. We're going to take a quick break and we'll return in just a second. <laughs> and we are back with episode number 64 of the all new, all different number one comics podcast. Bob, it is news time. It's time to talk about news. Wow. There's some news this week there's some crazy news this week i'm sure you know some of it yes uh you actually sent me an article on some of it so uh, we'll, we'll definitely I talk did. about that i want to talk first about something that's i don't know it's not weird but i thought that it was interesting um are you familiar with jim viscardi you know who that is uh no i do not so he is i He's like the owner or whatever, the operator, I, I don't know what, what word to use, of comicbook.com. So if you're okay. familiar with comicbook.com. I'm, I'm familiar with that, yes. Yeah, so they have a podcast, and I've listened to it for years. Like, I always listen to their podcast. I always you know, I heard a lot from him and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, he just quit comicbook.com to become a vice president over at, DC, or, sorry, over at Image Comics. Wow. So yeah, it's like it's like a basically like a marketing position or something, but mm -hmm. like, but yeah, he's over at Image Comics now. So wow. yeah, I thought that that was really interesting. Apparently, he's worked at Marvel before also, but I don't know exactly what his title was there. But yeah, Jim Biscardi quitting ComicBook.com to be an Image Comics vice president. I just I think that that's so interesting because it's Image Comics. If it was anywhere else, I'd be like, okay, cool, good for him. Um, Image Comics, though, is like, you know, built upon uh, being comic book creators. You know, that was like the whole point of it and everything. It was like the punk rock movement of the early 90s or whatever. You right. know, like we're going to we're going to ditch the big two and take it into our own hands. And now they're like hiring somebody outside of that. Like seems a little weird. I mean, I know they've done a lot of stuff with people they didn't originate with, of course, but somebody who's not like a comic book artist or writer just seems like, I, I don't know. I don't know how to feel about that. It seems odd. That, that is odd, but he's going to be the vice president of marketing. Something like that. Yeah. And, you know, coming from, uh, coming from, uh, you said comic book movie. Yeah. Comic book.com. Comic book.com. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you do have to market your brand sure. online and all that. So, I can, I can, I can definitely see it. I mean, if, if, you know, you've got an online, online website, I mean, you definitely, you know, you definitely have marketing skills. Sure. And I don't see any problem with that side of it. It's just, I, I think it's kind of weird. And I, I guess like you pointed out, I mean, it's not like he's doing like, you know, like creative input or anything. Right. Probably. I mean, like, it's, it's not like he's over, it's not like he's vice president of, you know, editors or vice yeah, yeah. president of writing or 
Vice president, I'm just drunk, a spitball. <laughs> of, of other things. Yeah, yeah I, I don't know. Just thought it was an interesting piece of news. Um, I, I guess, you know, before I get into the heavy news, we'll, uh, we'll go with some of the lighter news because there is heavy news this week, of course. But uh, an article you sent me, you know, that we definitely want to talk about a, l- a little bit. Let's talk about that. So Marvel Studios, the Fantastic Four continues to round out its cast. With and, and I'm paraphrasing here. This is from somewhere else. I don't, I don't remember where. But uh, with Deadline reporting that Julia Gardner, or sorry, Garner, has been cast in the film as a version of the Silver Surfer. According to Deadline's report, Gardner will play Shala Bal, Bal, I don't know, <laughs> um, uh, will play a Shala Bal version of the iconic comic character. Uh, and, <clears throat> excuse me. This is a reference to Marvel Comics character Shala Bal, who is the lover of Norrin Rad, the traditional Silver Surfer, who is a member of a race of aliens known as the Zen, whatever. Bob, I can't say that word. La- is it Labians. Zen Law? Huh? Is it Zen Law? Zen Lavins? Labians? I don't know. So, something like that. Oh, uh, yeah, Zen Lavians. Lavians, okay, that's how you pronounce it. Yeah, it, it's always funny whenever you read comics for like a long time and you like hear these words in your brain and you have to say them out loud, like these weird, crazy races of aliens and stuff you've never you, said you, out loud you before. You can say it perfectly in your head, <laughs> but when you try to say it out loud, <laughs> yeah. it comes out as word salad. You're like, oh, what, what did I just say? Exactly. What, what am I trying to say here? Exactly. Anyways, uh,. <laughs> So this is like big news. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, a lot of people are talking about this. A lot of people have a problem with this. Um, of course. Then you have yeah, you have the more passive people like me who could give a shit. But um, let's talk about it. Let's talk about what per- potential problems people may have. Let's talk about some of the stuff that I've heard online. Some of the stuff that you've probably heard as well. Oh, I know the biggest problem people are gonna have. <laughs> and it, I mean, it's obvious. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, female. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, uh, but the only thing I have to say to that is, you know, Hollywood's been doing that for years. It's not going anywhere anytime soon. Mm-hmm. So get over yourself. I I guess I look at it like this. I mean, again, I'm not gonna have a problem with anything like that because I don't care about stuff like that. Right. But it's it's a female. Uh, it, it, it's a character that's from the comics, so it's not like. It's not like they've gender swapped the Silver Surfer. That's not what happened. Um, they're not saying let's take Norn Rad and make him a woman now. Right. Um, that's that's not the case here. Make that's him what a Noreen lot of Rad. yeah, exactly. That's what a lot of people are going to assume. Right. Uh, yeah. They're gonna because they only know you know people who don't have like deep lore in the comics. Because look, this character came out in Silver Surfer number one, so she's been around for a very long time. Um, but. You know, people who don't have that history, who don't read comics, who don't know that kind of thing or whatever, just looking at, you know, picking out headlines or whatever, looking for things to complain about, you know, all they see is, okay, they've changed the Silver Surfer that I know, you know, from some random Fantastic Four cartoon or a movie, a shitty movie that came out, you know, however long ago and turn it into a woman. That's all they're going to hear. So that is not the case. You know, that's not the case at all. Uh, Shalabal has... Like I said, been around since Silver Surfer number one, which predates both you and I uh, by a long shot. So and is a female <laughs> character. Yeah, exactly. So um, I, I I don't know, but we were talking about this how this may get introduced because if you look at it on the surface level, yeah, you could say okay, they're just gonna make she's the Silver Surfer, um, uh, but as as we noted, you know, in our conversation in the comics, that's Norn Rad's wife. Mm-hmm. So. Is this a, a possible way to like build up, um, you know, mythos of, of, of the Silver Surfer and their whole race and Norn Rad and all of that? Um, are they going to like, you know, bring him in and then, you know, possibly build a movie around him or something like could they be doing more with the character and trying to lay some groundwork? Yeah, they absolutely could. Could they just be saying like we we don't want like I, I don't know. I mean, I, I have no idea what their intentions are, but like. It's so funny because I saw a video just this morning and it was like this dude was, you know, trying to make some big joke. Like he was a whole it was like a YouTuber, you know, or whatever. And and the beginning of his video was like funeral music and he came out with flowers and he's like, well, Disney is dead. The MCU is dead. You know, blah. and I'm like, because in your mind, they're casting the Silver Surfer as a female. That's the problem here. Like, really? Like, that's all you have going on in your life. (laughs) It's that important to you. Okay, like like we. (laughs) both talked about i mean they could still have norn rad yeah i mean nobody has any idea what the script is yeah in a workaround (laughs) i mean 
yeah, Shalabong could be the Silver Surfer at first, mm-hmm. but they could still have plans where Nornrad is becomes the Silver Surfer at the end of the movie or somewhere down the line. Mm-hmm. And, you know, also, I mean, they could be mixing a, just a Fantastic Four movie with a what if. You know, sure. I mean, what if Shaw Ball became the Silver Surfer? Yeah, why not? I mean, yeah. they could really be doing anything here. We have no clue. Yeah. The crazy thing is, you know, we don't know much about the movie. Of course, we all have, you know, know the Silver, sorry, the uh, Fantastic Four, you know, origin story and all that. And we've seen it played out on screen uh, many, quite a many few times. times. Yeah, and, and all of that. And, uh, you know, we don't know much, but this movie is scheduled to come out like basically like a year from now. Isn't it like June 25th of 2025 or so, some, yeah. something close to that date? So. Uh, yeah, so I, I don't know. There's still a, a lot more that could happen here. Who mm-hmm. knows? I just, I'm sorry. I know I come across as, as this kind of person, but like, just really, like, if that's what you have a problem with, just get over yourself. Who cares? Mm-hmm. Like, who really cares? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what else to say about it. It's it's just it's so weird to me that this would be like anybody's like biggest problem in the world uh, that that the Silver Surfer could possibly be a female. Well, and Marvel has done this in the past. Sure, with, you know some of their characters, and you know I I want to say it's a bigger issue just because the character is as big as the character is. Mm-hmm. I mean, you had. You had in the Captain Marvel movie that just came out, uh, I cannot remember the character's name, the um, the Kree that took over for Roman, basically. Mm-hmm. I mean, that that character being in Life as a Male in the comics. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, and I know there's been a couple of other characters that have been gender swapped over the years, just none, none of them come to mind right now. So, they've been doing this for years. So, I mean, I don't have a problem with it, you know, if it's a good performance. I guess I just don't see the argument, you know? Like, I, I don't see, like, what that does to anything. Who who cares, you yeah. know? Uh, they're not – I mean, if, if you're, like, really uh, – if you're really, you know, big on the history of the comics or something and, like, all that's really, really important to you, well, they've got to change things to adapt to the screen anyways. Like, we all know that. They're going to change, like, certain little things here and there. Um so I mean, it doesn't take away you know what you love in the comic books no, just because something's changed no, in a movie. You know, uh, no, it doesn't really matter. You know, all I care is the movie's good. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. I, I just I think it's strange. It's we've talked about this before. We're definitely at like a time and place where you know it's <laughs> comic book movies, the su- whole superhero genre and all that has been flipped on its head. And the sad thing is, it's not just movie critics and stuff like that. It's starting to become us, you know, it's starting to become the people that, uh, that loved that stuff. in in the beginning, you know, us that came from comic books, you know, they're complaining about it now. And it's just like, be careful, you know, because sooner or later, this stuff's not going to be around at all anymore. You don't have anything to watch, you know, like there's, you're going to go back to uh, having, you know, only Martin Scorsese and Christopher Nolan movies to watch. You know, that's going to be all it is. I don't know. I know that's an extreme <laughs> thought, but uh, but there won't be any of this. You know, it's it's going to start dwindling dwindling down. Like, support these things if you can. I'm not saying go out and support a bad movie if you don't like it, but like, just like we talked about a little while ago with Madam Web, like, come on, people. It was not the worst movie ever made. That is crazy. Like, that's crazy that anybody would say that because your expectations are are through the freaking roof and are they realistic? Like probably not, you know, um, maybe go in with, with expectations of, can I sit down and just like, in you know, enjoy a movie or whatever, like not, is this the most comic book accurate thing I've ever seen in my life? And, and all of this, like, they're not going to be sorry. They can't do that. Right. Um, I, I don't know. I think it's a really interesting thing to, to ponder and I'll, I'll let it go at that because I don't want to alienate anybody that has a different opinion here. But um, I, I don't know. As more unfolds, like, of course, we'll talk about it some more. But uh, next up, Bob, are, are you a Matrix fan? I was. <laughs> Were you? Okay. Until, I, they, <laughs> until they started uh, watering down the product. Well, Matrix is kind of like, uh, it's it's not like as far over as the Batman or anything like that for me. But it's it's almost like Avatar for me. 
you know, I've tried to watch it a few times. I just never really got into it. It's just mm-hmm. not my thing. Mm-hmm. I don't understand really what's going Even on. Even the first film? Yeah, maybe maybe I'm too simple for. <laughs> oh, I, I, I love the first film. Maybe I, I just I, don't understand. I thought the but, first film was groundbreaking. Yeah, I mean, definitely visually, uh, but we've got a fifth movie in development at Warner Brothers, and it's uh, gonna be by Daredevil series creator Drew Goddard. Um, writing and directing so mm-hmm. oh he's gonna write and direct yeah apparently so yeah i want to hear your thoughts on this because i watched the daredevil show i liked it mm-hmm. um i don't uh, again like i'm not a huge matrix <laughs> fan don't know much about the matrix whatever like but what are your thoughts on on having drew goddard here i mean i i think it could be i think it could be good mm-hmm. um you know i mean the last matrix film wasn't exactly wasn't exactly up to snuff and even now the, when did that come out matrix four i don't write like because all the the first matrix like the, the first three movies basically like took place in the late 90s right or, or were came out in the late 90s early 2000s yeah okay so the fourth one was it like one of those like very far removed to come out in like 2010 or yeah, something oh, yeah it okay. was it was it, i mean farther removed with from even that I mean, oh, okay. we're talking just even a few years ago oh i see i see okay um, I just, I just, I just cannot remember exactly mm. when it came out. Gotcha. Um, I mean, I think it could be good. I mean, you know, Drew Goddard did good work on Daredevil. I'm just, you know, I'm just not, fam- I'm just not too familiar with anything else he's really done. Yeah. Uh, me either. Um, oh yeah. And I'm seeing here the first Matrix came out in 99. So yeah, 99. <laughs> I was thinking okay. a little earlier than that, okay. but I guess not. No, no. I I knew it. I knew, you know, you know, it was around the turn of the millennium mm-hmm. because, you know, I mean, that was, that was a perfect film. I mean, it was all about computers and yeah. computers turning against humanity. So, I mean, that, ju- that just, you know, fed on the whole Y2K thing <laughs> yeah. that people were scared of, oh, which God, ended up yeah. being, you know, nothing. I don't know, man. My dog died that night. You know, I was, uh... <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So 99 for the first one, 2003 for the, for the second and third, uh, May 15th, 2003 for the second, November 5th for the, for the third. That's, that's pretty crazy in the same year there. And then the matrix, Resur- the matrix resurrections in, uh, 2021 so yeah 2021. very very far from yeah, 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 yeah almost far. almost a good 20 years there 18 years it, it was kind of it was kind of like a um it was kind of like a bill and ted's kind of thing okay <laughs> where you know the second film came out so you know so long after mm-hmm. i mean it, st- it had keanu reeves in it but of course he was much much older <laughs> yeah just a little bit poor keanu um I, you know, actually, speaking of that, the only one that I've actually really sat down and, like, understood well enough was the Animatrix. Do you remember that? <laughs> I, I've never seen the Animatrix. Oh, it was, it was actually really cool. It was a lot of fun. Um, I mean, I yeah, I can't say I understood it. But I do. I do. <laughs> I remember it coming out and watching it. I do remember when the original uh, Matrix came out for, uh, came out on DVD. They had the Animatrix. They had a, you know, special edition you know, bundled with the Animatrix. And oh, okay. I think later on down the line, they released the Animatrix as a standalone DVD. Yeah, yeah, that's what I had. I definitely had it, you know. Uh, again, working at Blockbuster there, you know, I, I grabbed that. Uh, yeah, so anyways, uh, a fifth Matrix movie coming out, or at least in in development with Drew Goddard attached to write and direct there. So my last little bit of news before we get to the kind of big news that, you know, it's going to be a little heavier is, I don't know if you've heard this. I just heard this this morning, actually. Mm -hmm. So you're familiar with Roy Thomas, I'm sure. Oh yeah. Um, (laughs) He created one of my favorite characters. Yes. Uh, Is it the, uh, the badger? No. Okay. Um, (laughs) uh, So I'm sure you're familiar with a uh, Marvel comic book, the incredible Hulk Um, ran for a little while. There's, few volumes of it yeah, just, a little, <clears throat> just a few and also you're familiar with a character named wolverine i've heard <laughs> once or twice heard of him um so in a shocking turn of events be- you know however many years later this is and, and roy thomas of course being deceased uh roy thomas is 
possibly, now this is 100% confirmed yet, but being added to list of co-creator of Wolverine. Um, and what <laughs> the, the reasoning for this is his uh, widow has shared that he has documentation that he named the character and he also created the Canadian like uh, origin backstory there for the character. So in addition to what? Uh, uh, Herb Tempe. Uh-huh. Sal, is it Sal Bushima? Oh. Yes. Okay. Sal yeah. Bushima. Yeah. So in addition to them, uh, Roy Thomas's name might be popping up whenever you see Wolverine stuff huh. pretty soon. So yeah, really interesting. Kind of interesting that that's never been you know addressed until now until twenty twenty four year of the dragon. But um, and I, I do I do want to stop you there. Sure. Oh, Roy Thomas is is still alive. Really? Yes. Oh no. Okay. Yes. Well, well, my apologies. <laughs> um, yeah, I you know my my new source uh, didn't have that information. Actually, they were they were calling him his widow and stuff. So. Wow, very interesting. But uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> either way, you might you might be seeing Roy Thomas's name uh, attached to a list of co-creators for Wolverine coming up pretty soon, which could be cool, especially like with the Wolverine and Deadpool movie coming out. You know, maybe grab some royalties off of that or something. Uh, it could be good for, I guess, the living Roy Thomas and, that, <laughs> and I mean, family. That is, <laughs> I mean. Would you call that a Bill Finger situation? I guess so. Kind of seems like one, Except, right? I mean, Bill Finger, he didn't get credited to <laughs> after he passed away. Sure. Uh, well, <sighs> something like that. Uh, Bob, over to the, the heavier news. The the news that it's, it's kind of like the um, elephant in the room. I, I don't really want to talk about this. Mm -hmm. It kind of sucks. Mm -hmm. um, it, it really sucks, of course, but... Uh, we're going to talk about it, of course. I'm sure you're familiar with the news that came out this week about Ed Piscor's passing. Mm -hmm. uh, and let me start with this. This is, I, I don't know how to approach these kinds of subjects, but, you know, as a disclaimer, I'll do my disclaimer. I'm going to go ahead and forego the disclaimer music because this one's a little more somber. Right. But, uh, <laughs> um, as a disclaimer, you know, this deals with like self-harm and, and stuff like that. Uh I, I don't I don't have any of the uh, suicide prevention you know stuff in front of me or anything but um you know definitely uh, if you're dealing with with thoughts like that you know please reach out get some help uh, talk to somebody in your family uh, friends whatever you can do but don't do it alone that's a heavy heavy thing to have to deal with yeah. and uh, yeah um, e either way Ed Piscor such a like roller coaster that's been going on just just uh, in a very short amount of time here, at least that we're privy to. So let me give you a timeline really quick for anybody who doesn't know. Uh, Ed Piscor, of course, is, you know, Bobby's like right in between our ages. You know, he's, he's he was 41 when he passed. Uh, and he just passed April 1st, by the way, you know, so just a few days ago. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, so Ed Piscor, 41, uh, he's, he's been illustrating and writing comics for for a little while now had a really popular youtube channel where him and another creator you know uh talked about uh, creating comics and, and things like that and ed has uh done some really big things uh hip-hop family tree is like one of his biggest credits if you've never read that book i think it's out from fantagraphics and it's like it goes over the history of like you know hip-hop from its incarnation to like present day and does it and it's really i don't i don't know exactly how to talk about like his vibe as like a cartoonist you know like exactly right. how his illustration um is but it, it's really cool it's really unique uh really interesting stuff so uh so anyways ed Piscor have been doing that for for quite a while some some allegations came out very recently that he had been talking to a minor online and the conversations were like you know, n not okay to be talking to minor online with for a 40 year old guy. So, uh, those came out. I don't know the exact context of, of, of what happened, but I think he pretty much, you know, it, 
God, it's such a sensitive subject. I don't, I don't know. know. I, know. I, don't know. I, I don't want to go into those parts of it because I don't want to speculate anything right. here. But right. um, either way, those allegations came out and basically Ed came online, you know, deleted his social media and stuff like that. Uh, his YouTube channel was down for a little while. And he said that uh, that he was now being like bullied by, you know, uh, like cancel culture people and stuff like this. So on, I want to say uh, March 30th, 31st, something like that, Ed posted a note. And uh, Ed's note was, you know, something to the effect of, uh, you know, it was, it's a pretty, it's a pretty crazy note. Mm. If you want to go look it up, I'm not going to sit here and, and, and uh, try to do it in my own words or anything. But basically he, you know, left a note saying he was, he was going to be leaving the world behind and here's what people could do, you know, with his possessions and, and stuff like this. And this happened because of this, uh, you know, is what it said. So, you know, friends and, and stuff like that, you know, reached out, tried to have like cops go to his house and check on him and everything, but he was gone. Like they couldn't find him anywhere. And then he was found deceased on April 1st. So again, I don't know how to approach this subject. It's, it's very weird. It's not something that we normally get into, but right. I think it is an imp important thing just to kind of touch on. I, I told a friend this yesterday because the, the first thing, you know, is a comic book friend. And he was like, so how about the news? And I was like, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't know like what opinion to have here. I'm kind of confused. Obviously not enough has been, you know, out uh, for, for us to know about to really form an opinion on something like that. Now, if he's talking to minors and grooming them online and all of that, that's obviously wrong. I mean, that's my opinion on that. That's not okay. Um, and, and that sucks. Do I think that, you know, uh, I, I guess, again, I'm going to stumble here because I don't know even what to say. But, like, I um, I, I'm very sad that that's what happened because of it. I don't, I don't, I definitely don't condone that. Um, but I do not have the experience of having to uh, deal with those kind of repercussions. So, so I don't know. Um, again, I don't know much uh, about what to say about it other than it's, it's crazy news and I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It, it's very hard. It's like, uh, you don't want to, um, say the wrong thing here and and we don't know enough information for me to form an opinion on it really uh of course but to the victims and to his family you know that really sucks yeah i guess but, that's the best thing i can say you know again like you know you just said you don't want to say the right thing mm -hmm. you don't want to say the wrong thing without having all the facts yeah exactly because you could think you'd be saying the right thing yep. and then two or three days later you know more comes out and it's like that was wrong of me to say. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you always got to be careful. You don't want to be on the wrong side of history, especially uh, recording and putting it online. But, um, but yeah, it's just you know we have to touch up on it. You know, it's news in the industry, of course. Like it's it's big news, and and again, I think the most important thing we could say here is is if you have those kinds of thoughts or if you're backed into that kind of situation where you think that that's the only way for you or whatever, like please reach out, get some help. Um, you don't have to go at it alone ever. So really crazy news. Um, yeah, Bob, I, I think that's the end of the news for me, unless you have anything you want to add. No, I mean, sorry, I had to swallow. That. <laughs> um, I did, I, I did just want to bring up, um, that there's a new Kickstarter going on at this moment. Oh it's yes. Going yes, on yes. for a few days, a, uh, New comic company, Ironclad Comics, who basically, you know, it, it's funny we're doing an image, you know, comics, mm -hmm. and you're bringing up, you know, image comics, because they talk about, you know, being, um, I, I don't know if I want to say, you know, disillusion is the right <laughs> thing, but, you know, they, they kind of wanted to do their own thing, mm -hmm. and it's, um, it's about uh, five or six guys, if I'm... Correct, and one of them was one of them actually. We uh, it was our second ever interview. Oh wow! Is that correct? Way way back then, yeah, uh, something like that. With uh, oh, and I know I'm gonna butcher his name, <laughs> and I'm very very sorry. 
<laughs> I, I should have listened to. I should have listened back to the podcast. <laughs> hey, I'm usually the one that gets the butcher names here. Come yes, on, be careful. But, uh, trying to take my job. Uh, uh, very, very talented artist, Machao Pereira. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, oh yeah, very talented. And you know, this book has been talked about for you know a while now. I've been aware of it for a while. I'm sure you have been aware of it for a while. Mm-hmm. It's call it the warden yep and i don't know a whole lot about it i didn't i didn't you know want to read a whole lot about it you know i i kind of just wanted to you know read it and form my own opinion when it comes out and like i said it's on kickstarter right now and as of this moment as of this morning it was probably what did they say about 80 percent had been funded of their two thousand dollar goal of their two thousand dollar goal. Oh wow! And it, it, I mean, it still got. I believe it ends May first. Nice. So it still got a long, long way to go, and I mean, it it's got stretch goals all the way up to uh, twenty thousand, and I believe, I don't know how much will be allocated to doing a second, you know second graphic novel mm-hmm. but i mean just you know just i was sold just on the artwork alone oh yeah well with a great artist like <laughs> i mean like like you said we can't say his name machayu machao uh, machao okay yeah uh yeah i mean such a good artist so if you got him on a book yeah that's definitely worth it <laughs> even even if for some odd reason the story sucked um you know it's worth it just to look at the art but yeah i'm sure it doesn't uh yeah really cool um so 80 percent funded we're only on april 4th so yeah yeah, looks like looks like this is gonna get funded oh um, yeah which is awesome oh yeah always really good to hear you know a successful kickstarter or something like that especially with such a good artist on board excuse me (laughs) um but yeah really cool uh i you know i I i think that you know uh knowing that we have spoken to him before as you said, our second interview really mm-hmm. there, uh, you know, would love to have those guys on the podcast and, and talk about this book. So hopefully well, yeah, we can make and, something like that happen. You know, like I told you, I did reach out to Machow mm-hmm. on uh, Instagram and he definitely said he'd be, you know, he, he'd love to be back on the podcast. Cool. And, you know, he also said most of the time when he does talk about the Kickstarter, he talks about it with the entire group. So, oh, very cool. I mean, we yeah we would definitely love to have you know everybody on from ironclad comics so they could you know talk about the book talk Mm -hmm. about the kickstarter you know what the book is about oh yeah really cool stuff uh well yeah make sure you guys check out that kickstarter that's the warden from ironclad comics so uh yeah definitely check that out we're gonna take a quick break and we'll return in just a moment to go over some of the new books that are out in shops this week And we are back with episode number 64 of the all new, all different number one comics podcast to talk to you about some new books that dropped this week in local comic book shops. Uh, Bob, we of course had the new number one from Marvel Deadpool. So volume 10 of Deadpool. This one's got the first appearance of death grip. Don't know if it has anything to do with the death grips band, but possibly uh, we also got, you know, in, in conjunction with the book we're talking about this week, uh, Ghost Machine has uh, put out their three books, you know, their first three uh, books. And of course, we're talking about Red Coat today on the podcast. But uh, we also have Rook Exodus and Geiger number one. So the second volume of Geiger. And Bob, all of these written by Jeff Johns. Jeff Johns wrote three oversized as hell books this week. Um, pretty crazy. Uh, pretty crazy indeed. I hope everybody listening knows who Jeff Johns is. <laughs> well, hopefully. Uh, also from Marvel Comics, we got Immortal Thor issue number nine. This one has the first cameo appearance of Chad Hammer, a corporate mascot version of Thor in the employee of Roxxon, and the lead on sorry the lead in to the Roxxon presents Thor one shot. This comic has become so freaking meta, and it's so weird. It's good, but it's very very strange. Um, from DC Comics, we got Poison Ivy issue 21, the origin of the first meeting of Batman and Poison Ivy. <laughs> I'm so tired, Bob. We know so how tired. you feel about the first meeting. God, it's just so stupid. What, like, what are we even talking about? 
we also got from Marvel Comics Spider-Man Shadow of the Green Goblin 1. This is the origin of Proto-Goblin, the research assistant that preceded Norman Osborn as the first test subject of the Goblin, Goblin formula. This one is written by J.D. Mat Mattis. Um, so uh, pretty interesting um, uh, for, for him to... I mean, I guess J.D. Mattis is definitely still writing comics, but I think he does it in that, you know, 80s, 90s kind of way. They're like super heavy with dialogue and all that. Uh, we also got from DC Comics Suicide Squad Kill Arkham Asylum 3. That includes a uh, code for Scarface Weapon Digital Token. I, these are just words. I, it's not even a sentence. Includes a code for the Scarface Weapon Digital Token redeemed in the Kill the Justice League video game. I like, mean, it, 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 makes sense to me. it makes more sense to me just because I know, <laughs> you know, um, that's a video game. Oh, yeah. Well, video games. There you go. Uh, from Image Comics, we got the eighth printing. Sorry, the fifth printing. <laughs> wow. I'm all over the place. Eight the already? The fifth printing of Transformers number one. All the way up to a fifth print. Very cool. And from Marvel Comics, we got Vengeance of Moon Knight number four with the identity of the new Moon Knight revealed. Bob, there was like a whole bunch of uh, vampire homage covers that came out for Marvel this week. I got suckered into picking all of them up because they all looked so cool. The uh -huh. only one I didn't get was the She-Hulk one because I didn't want to break up my run of She-Hulk and have like a random variant in there because I love the covers so much. So right. I was like, I'm not going to do it for She-Hulk. Um, I did buy two copies of something. I don't remember what it was just to get. Oh, it was Venom. So I could get the Rose Besh and the uh, Vampire variant. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I, I didn't do it for She-Hulk. I was like, I'm stopping there. Uh, but yeah, those are some of the new books that dropped in comic book shops this week. We'll take a quick break and then we'll be right back to talk about Red Coat number one. And we are back with the all new, all different number one comics podcast to talk about Red Coat. Oh, by the way, this is episode number 64. If I didn't already say that 64 times. Just a few times. <laughs> Bob, Red Coat, uh, let's... Here, real quick, we're going to do the uh, uh, synopsis from... There's nothing real quick. I know. Well, yeah, real uh, long. We're going to do the synopsis from Image slash Ghost Machine comics. Uh, series premiere, Immortal Mercenary, kind of a tool, meets Simon Pure, the newest unnamed hero created by comic all-stars Jeff Johns and Brian Hitch. British redcoat and all-around rogue Simon mysteriously became immortal in 1776 after a run-in with the clandestine cabal known as the Founding Fathers, which included George Washington, John Hancock, and many other prominent American Revolutionary War leaders. Since that fateful day, Simon has led a life of adventure and adversary, rubbing elbows and sometimes fists with many of history's most renowned figures, including his nemesis, Benedict Arnold, Albert Einstein, Annie Oakley, and many more. One thing they all agree on, they never want to see him again. But what are the true origins and the extent of Simon's power and the mysterious organization behind them? And how has it secretly shaped America and the world? Simon's on a quest to find out. Don't miss this new entry in the exciting Ghost Machine rollout. And it's 34 pages of story for only $3.99. So that is the synopsis from Ghost Machine there. So let's talk about the creators then. Jeff Johns, Bob, you ever heard of him? Vaguely familiar. <laughs> He's a comic book writer, former DC Comics president and chief creative officer, New York Times bestselling author, and the CEO of Mad Ghost Productions. Jeff Johns has left his mark on the comic book industry by renewing interest and revitalizing some of DC's biggest franchises, such as Green Lantern, The Flash, Justice Society of America, and Bob's favorite comic of all time, Aquaman. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jeff has definitely done some things, um, like you know the aforementioned Green Lantern, Justice Society of America, Justice League, The Flash, Teen Titans, Fifty Two, Action Comics, Aquaman. Uh, he's worked on the Avengers, one of Bob's real favorite comics. Uh, <laughs> Booster Gold, Doomsday Clock, uh, 
Shazam. I don't know. The guy's done a billion things. If I sat here and listed off everything Jeff Johns has did. Done, we'd be here for a while. Yeah, we'd really be here a long time. So we're not going to do that. But let's talk about the artist Brian Hitch. Brian Hitch is a British comic book artist that's known for working on titles like The Ultimates, Captain America, and Fantastic Four. The guy's done a whole bunch of stuff. Venom, Justice League, The Ultimates, Ultimates 2, Fantastic Four, Justice League of America, The Authority, Aquaman, Batman's Grave, The Sensational She-Hulk, Death's Head, Wolverine, The Best There Is, Age of Ultron, Stormwatch, Wonder Woman, Victory, Superman, Overkill, America's Got Powers, Ultimate Invasion, blah, blah, blah. I could go on, but I won't. <laughs> Just like Jeff Jones would be here for a while. <laughs> yeah, for a little while. Also, we have colorist Brad Anderson and letterer Rob Lee. Bob, I'm going to get into my summary of the book here. Okay. Red Coat opens in 1775. Paul Revere rides his horse and warns that the Red Coats are coming. He's then attacked by the British until all of a sudden a horde of fireflies comes and attacks them and eats all of their flesh off. <laughs> Wow, in a, a stunning turn of events, that's what happens. Very nice, for sure, actually. <laughs> right. Uh, Paul is rescued by John Hancock, who tells Paul's uh, who's who, sorry, who tells Paul he used the magic of the founding fathers. Over to Christmas Day, seventeen seventy six, we get a huge chunk of narrative, and we meet Simon Pure as he runs from soldiers and hides in a church where men in red hoods perform a ritual on Ben Franklin. Simon falls from the upper story and lands in the middle of what was supposed to happen to Ben. Simon dies only to be reborn under the remains of the church. Over to November 3rd, 1892, Simon is awoken in his room and we learn that he's a mercenary and we see many times people have come for and killed him over the last hundred plus years. We also learn that due to his or mal sorry, <laughs> immortality, <laughs> he's always starving and always broke. Simon lands in a pub where he owes the owner a large debt and she's fed up and turns him in over to the men looking for him. Simon's killed again. This time his grave is dug up by a young boy. The boy is young Albert Einstein who tells Simon he needs his magic to stop a great evil. And then suddenly the hooded men return with guns drawn on the pair. And that wraps up our book. Bob, let's get into this crazy, crazy thing. Um... And the dogs have a lot to say about it. So uh, it, I, I, I'm with you guys. It is a crazy book. There's lots and lots to talk about here. So let's get into the story, the beats, dialogue, narrative, world building, all of that stuff. What did you think about the beats of this crazy story? I thought the beats flowed smoothly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they really did. I, I, You know, I honestly like, I don't know what that format of storytelling is called where you span like uh, periods of time and, you know, uh, poke in at certain periods and you know mm -hmm. uh not illustrate but you know showcase them or whatever mm -hmm. but i i like that form of storytelling yeah. i think it's a lot of fun it's of course gonna have to work with this book as our character is an, an immortal so <laughs> um you know uh, we can't see everything happen day to day it's gotta kind of go in and out through time but yeah the story beats here are really cool it's it's very interesting how we start off with uh simon's origin and then how you know it's it's like how he gets a superpower it's his superhero origin he steps in for you know what was happening to ben franklin ben franklin was about to get his immortality there and then simon steals his thunder and uh and from there yeah we go in and out through history and then we kind of land on uh, a time where albert einstein's a young boy and needs his help so the uh, the only th the only hiccup well a slight hiccup i could say um if there were any mm -hmm. was the whole firefly scene i mean that that was kind of like seeing that and then what the book focused on mm -hmm. you know which i'm sure it'll be explained again later but showing that and what the what the book was on i mean you did see those characters again i mean you didn't see paul Rivera again you didn't see john hancock again yep i mean you know i mean they could come back later and on down the line but i mean that was the only hiccup for me i don't know how you felt about that yeah it was it was a little weird a little disjointed uh in that but i guess it's just you know so they could squeeze in as many historical figures as they can through the telling of the story which kind of makes sense but yeah i i hear you it would have been nice to know like you know what's going on with them or whatever they are the founding fathers so to say and that's like the 
name of their you know group or organization or whatever also so uh, yeah really really interesting um how about the dialogue then what did you feel about the dialogue in here i mean uh, the yeah the dialogue i mean you had the you know uh the british army or the yeah. redcoats mm-hmm. speaking the queen's english um you know you had uh you know simon you know speaking like a mercenary yep um you know, you had the um, guy searching for him. I mean, um, so, yeah, I didn't have a problem with the dialogue. I had nothing. Yeah, the dialogue was really straightforward for mm-hmm. me. No no problems there. It was, I, I honestly asked this when I picked up my books yesterday because uh, one of the employees, actually, you know, uh, the, the one that we talked about whenever we talked about our, our local shop getting, you know, run into the employee that was actually injured there. Thank um, you. Yep. This was like her pick of the week. So, um so I was like, you know, I, I said, is it is it really wordy? Is it really dialogue heavy? I said, I, I, no, actually, it's not. And I was like, oh, wow. OK, um, so there, there's parts in the narrative and we'll get into that where it gets a little heavy for a second, but it comes right back out of it. But uh, yeah, as far as dialogue, I think all of it worked. It was uh, pretty, you know, appropriate. And then we get to the the end of the book with Albert Einstein and it's really <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> really, really kind of crazy. Uh, you know, for a second, I was like, "How am I supposed to read this?" <laughs> see, and, um, I, and I can definitely see like there was one part in particular where uh, Simon gets dug up by mm-hmm. who we find out find out is a young Albert Einstein. Yep, and he's saying his English still isn't perfect because he only started learning it three days ago. <laughs> yeah. I could actually see knowing what I know about our. Albert Einstein, mm-hmm. how smart he was. I can actually see Albert Einstein saying that. Right? Yeah. Makes sense. Um, re- really, really kind of funny, though. Yeah, there's there's actually points in this book where it's like, it, it's kind of humorous. Like, yeah, it's, it's pretty good. Pretty good dialogue here. Um, so then the narrative of the book, uh, we already kind of broke into that structure. But, you know, the narrative here works for me. It... Uh, it definitely could have been, you know, that really exposition heavy narrative to mm-hmm. get us to where we need to be and everything. And Jeff Johns didn't do that. And I actually, you know, really appreciate that because uh, that's when I get bored and I get taken out of the story and everything. Right. Just kind of show me what's going on. You know, like I'll, I'll figure it out. It may take me a minute, but <laughs> but I'll figure it out. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to lie. When I, uh, when I was reading this book, the first thing that popped to mind and I do not know why it was the first thing that popped in my mind. It was Vandal Savage. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you drew those parallels. I, I didn't, but I could see that. <laughs> like, like I said, I, I mean, out of, you know, every character I could have thought of, you know, I could have thought of him. I could have thought of Immortal Man. Mm-hmm. I mean, <laughs> I, I could have I thought about, thought about a, a bunch of, you know, long lived you know, characters throughout mm-hmm. comic book history. But yeah, Vandal Savage came to mind. And I know, you know, they had, they had two different origins. I mean, Simon's immortality is based on mysticism, mm-hmm. whereas Vandal Savage's immortality is based on, you know, a rock that fell from space. Yep. <laughs> huh. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I see it now, though, that you're saying it. You know, I, I definitely see it. This is cool, though, because it takes, I, I don't know, it's like, it's a quick, you know, little origin. They're not going to explain much about it here in this first issue. Like, mm-hmm. you know, it's almost like take the origin of like, you know, Hulk or something like that, and like the gamma ray and all of that. Uh, it's it's just like, no, this thing was happening. This, this, uh, I, now I can't think of the word, this uh, ritual was happening. And, um, and, and, you know, he stepped in and, and took over for, for Ben Franklin, basically. Mm-hmm. But, um. I kind of like that, you know, like I'm, I'm kind of okay with it. Like I'm, I'm almost kind of done with people over explaining things to try to make them realistic and all that. This isn't realistic. It's not going to be realistic. This didn't happen. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I, I am. I'm glad they didn't take, um, you know, when, um, it first happened, I'm glad they didn't take too much time on it and yeah. dedicate like a couple pages to what was happening and yeah, all that. Just like, you know, 
he gets hit with he gets hit with the mystical power, and you know, uh, you know, it, it does show you know for a few panels, but it doesn't focus on that. Mm-hmm, it's mm-hmm. kind of like, okay, he get he got hit by mystical, he got hit by mystical power. This is what happened to him. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I I really like that too. I like that Jeff Johns trusts us enough to know you know right hey to just, put the pieces together yeah exactly i i feel like a lesser comic book writer would have really explained too much here um so i can appreciate that uh and then the world building bob what you think about the world building i mean it, it went from um you know the american revolution days mm-hmm. to the victorian era so, yeah yeah I, I like the world building i i kind of like when it goes to when i read comics and of course, you know, they're more few and far between, but where they deal with like different periods of time. I, yeah, I'm really into that too. I like it a lot. It's, it's actually a lot of fun. You know, it's, it's a really fun thing to explore. Yeah. Has it been done? Sure. But, um, but this is cool. I, I, I really like the world. I mean, not, here. yeah, not only do you get to explore different periods of time, but you kind of get to see that whole, you know, fish out of water thing. Yep. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Because I mean, they get they get so used to being in one period, or uh, some get so used to being in one period. You know, he dies, and it seems like he wakes up in another period. Uh, you know, and pointing that out, one of the things that I really liked the, you know, this goes back to the dialogue, but you know, just talking about storytelling overall here, is how he was talking about you know one of the first. Or, or, or sorry, you know, in the past he, he would die and then he would wake up, you know, in a grave and then die again because he's like so scared. I'm like, hey, that's yeah, for real. I mean, can you imagine that part? Like you always see the romanticized version of like being immortal. Like, you know, you get to just pop back up or whatever. Like, no, imagine. I'm, yeah, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure <laughs> most people, if they found out, found out they were buried alive. I'm sure they died just from the shock. Oh, knowing- yeah. Hey, I was buried alive. Oh yeah, so yeah, I like how they touched on on that. It's really cool. Maybe some uh, deep seated fears for Jeff Johns there. Uh, awesome. Maybe for all of us. But uh, let's get into the art then. Brian Hitch, of course, the illustrator here. Um, what do we think about the character art? I yeah, I liked it. I liked the character art. It when I first started reading this book and I was looking at the characters, I was thinking, you know, this is the Ultimates. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah, the, that's yeah, the, true. I mean, that's the exact place my mind went because the Ultimates. I mean, that was pretty much what got me back into comics. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I cracked this book open, and I'm like, "This is a character from the Ultimates." Yep. Yeah, it's very. It works really well with the story. I it can't does. imagine like any other style of art to go along with this. This is like really kind of perfect for for this. Like kind of what it needed to be. Um, yeah, the characters look great, and this is a very character-focused book. Yeah. We're, you know, going to have time-appropriate backgrounds and everything. There's some cool scenery, like the church and the, the ritual and everything going on. But as far as, you know, what really shines in the book is the characters. So I think that Brian Hitch was a great, great uh, match for Jeff Jones on this book. Mm-hmm. Definitely really good character work. Um, how about the backgrounds, Bob? I'm sure, uh, you know, without even opening the book again here, that it passes your background test. But yeah. as we know, we should, uh, you know, at least take a look, uh, double double check here. Oh yeah, yeah I, I think I, this I'm, I think this far exceeds. Um. You know, and, and again, <laughs> speaking of the ultimates, I mean, I'm definitely aware of Brian Hitch's artwork, mm-hmm. and I know he does really great detailed backgrounds. Yeah, Brian Hitch is like a master here. I love this panel we have open here where uh, it's kind of the church in the woods and there's all these bare trees around and the branches just extend to infinity. <laughs> like, it's so cool looking. Yeah, it's it's really good. There's some really good artwork in here. Of course, you know, we get back to like kind of like the rafters and the ceiling and everything. They're very detailed. Uh, you can see like, a lot of detail in the wood and, and all of that. And then we get to this full double page spread here of, yeah. of uh, Benjamin Franklin laying down, uh, you know, uh, uh, about to go through that ritual to get his superpowers and everything. Yeah, I mean, and, uh, you, I mean, you can, you can basically, you can see all the individual muscles in Ben Franklin. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. This is, this is really cool. There's a lot of cool stuff going on here. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things I wanted to, uh, 
to ask about. Bob, are you familiar with that symbol? And, and what I'm saying is there's like a little carpet in the room here and it's got like some kind of like mas Masonic symbol or whatever I, it kind of looks I'm like. I say it does, look, it does look, it reminds me of the Freemason symbol. Yeah, it looks a lot like but it. I mean, more, it's not the exact know, one, but. Stylized because, I mean, they're the founding fathers. Like, I yeah. mean, I'm sure they have their own symbol, but I mean, it, you know, definitely reminds me and it's Freemason um, reminiscent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very interesting. Uh, how about the locations? We kind of go to some locations here. <laughs> uh, we go to a few different locations. Uh, yeah, I, I I think the locations really work. Um, it's, yeah, very, I, I don't even know what I would say about them. You know, just like, just, this is like a, not a globe trotting adventure, of course, you know, because we're in the America or we're, we're in you know, the United States, but yeah. Um, but yeah, the locations really work. Like, even yeah, whenever I mean, we get into the little pub and. A lot of outdoor locations that are reminding me of, of you know, right. uh, movies or TV shows that I've seen, like, set in this time period. Like, I mean, yeah, we ba we basically stay in, you know, a, a certain geographical area, mm -hmm. but it's just shown in different time periods. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is... Which, you know, I, I like. It, it's one of those, like, you know... Um, where you see the memes with like a then photo and then a now photo. Yeah. Yeah. Really cool stuff. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm digging this. This is done really well. Mm -hmm. So then last thing, how about Brad Anderson's colors on the book? Uh, got any thoughts there? Again, it reminds me of reading the old <laughs> It really yeah. does. I don't know if he worked on that book. Yeah, I'm not too sure. I, I didn't look up his credits, but, uh, no, it doesn't look like, uh, it doesn't look well, I guess he's done a lot of things, actually. Uh, who knows? The, the guy's done a lot. Um, mainly action and detective. You know, a lot of uh, DC mm -hmm. work. But well, yeah, I mean, I can, I can definitely see, I can definitely see the uh, detective tone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I could actually see, I guess, uh, you know, um, tones for Batman can kind of work for Superman. Yeah, sure. So I mean, yeah, I, I, I definitely like them. They're not. They're not totally, you know, like pop out in your face vibrant, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, um, time spanning book like this about an immortal character, I think you don't need those bright, vibrant tones. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. This, this works really well. This mm -hmm. is a, this is a good looking book. Um, the colors work really well in, uh, along with, with Brian Hitch's art. So. Yeah, really, really good stuff. Um, how about you know the, the the question of the podcast is it enough to for you to recommend it to our listeners? You know, and and before before I say my answer, um, this book to me was you know, and I said last week when the wheel landed on uh, Redcoat, I was looking forward to the book, mm -hmm. but to me. This was kind of in the same vein of um, Elbire meets H.P. Lovecraft. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I thought, it, I thought it was a really cool idea because, mm -hmm. you know, of course, being somebody who, you know, likes history, I know, you know, what Redcoat meant and I know what it was going to deal with. Yep. But to me, this book was better than it should have been. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if, I mean, you know what I mean? Because... You know, something like Red Code, I thought it was going to be like a straightforward, you know, history piece. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I, I didn't think it would be what it was. So, yeah, I mean, just like Elvira meets H.P. Lovecraft, I was going in it uh, thinking it was going to be, you know, just, you know, just a straightforward, you know, uh, like historical war piece. Mm -hmm. And then it turns out to be something different. Yeah, something something much different, mm -hmm. and uh, so I'm I'm gonna take that as a yes. You're, you're yeah, you I, recommend I, people I'm, read it. I'm, <laughs> you're gonna I'm check out issue number two. I'm definitely, <laughs> I'm definitely gonna continue on this, and I would wholeheartedly recommend this to anybody. So here's the interesting thing, and I'll mm -hmm. I'll go over mine in a second. But um, in the back of this book, we have like a little timeline. I think they all have this. I haven't I haven't flipped through Rook Exodus or Geiger yet, but this one's got like a timeline. It's called the unnamed. Um, it's, it's, you know, and it's got, it's got a timeline here, you know, in 1776, red coat becomes a mortal. 
1864, Northerner begins his hunt. In 1944, The Munster is made. In 1972, Junkyard Joe comes online. Uh, that's the only... Uh, Junkyard Joe and Geiger are the only things I'm familiar with in here because they both exist already. Uh, in 1997, Widow X has her revenge. In present day, First Ghost is captured on film. Five years from now, the unknown war erupts. And 25 years from now, Geiger walks across America. So, so this, it's essentially where each book, each book takes place. Yeah, each, how they take place. Uh, I'm sure how they're going to okay. kind of intersect with one okay. another. I, why, did, what I, did, happens. I did not that because i did not flip that far yeah um this is this is really interesting and it does have you know i'll read this little uh, I, I don't know what you call this this little uh, excerpt blurb. that they have here yeah blurb whatever throughout history unlikely and strange heroes have risen and fallen these men and women are mysterious their identities and lives a secret but for a great evil to be stopped their stories must be told from a radioactive family man in the near future to a British assassin during the American Revolution to a robotic killing machine seeking its creator and more. They are the unnamed fighting the unknown war. Um, so I, the reason I kind of wanted to talk about that is, you know, before I get into my recommendation or not, is, <clears throat> is, is this. Uh, I trust Jeff Johns. Um, I'm not a huge DC guy, but from what I've read of Jeff Johns, I like his stuff. He's a good writer. Mm -hmm. I trust Brian Hitch. Very good illustrator. We already know that. Uh, great history with, with both of them here. So I trust those guys. I trust Ghost Machine. You know, I think that it's a, a good idea. Um, you know, kind of connecting this whole thing, like coming out with this new imprint where everything's connected and all of that. Uh, when, like... Like you, when the wheel landed on this, I was intrigued. But at the same time, I was like, you know, while I do like history, I don't really want like a straightforward historic retelling of something mm -hmm. in comics. Like we've seen that kind of thing. Like it just usually falls flat to me. I don't care enough, whatever. Um, I was nervous about this book and I was even nervous when I opened it up and started reading it, even to the point where it started to get supernatural and the fireflies came out and everything, I was still kind of like, I don't know what's going on here. I'm not 100% sold. Um, as the book unfolds and as I read it a few times and all of that, I really kind of started to like this book a lot. Uh, and I, I really like the artwork. So let me, let me take that out of the equation really quick and only talk about the writing and only talk about this story in particular. Um, it's, it's always interesting to see an alternate history. Like I like stuff like mm. that. Again, I'm not a hundred percent sure that I like it in comic book form. Uh, I, I, I don't know why. I don't know how to like pinpoint what I like or don't like about that, but um, it, it's, it's just like a, you know, medium that I'm not prepared to hear like alternate alternative history or whatever on. Um, but again, like as I read this book, as we were getting through it, as, as even some of the problems that I had with the character, which were, you know, number one, the character kind of calling himself out, you know, kind of like, I'm a, I'm a piece of shit. You know, <laughs> I don't like myself, you know, whatever yeah. kind of guy. I'm like, this it's really kind of stacking the odds against it here for me to be able to recommend this. Um, but I like the immortal vibes of it. And I like how we're encountering, he's encountering these different people throughout history. I like how, Einstein's got to go to him for help with something. Um, I like what this is setting up, and I really, really like the fact that this is an immortal dude who's obviously going to, you know, be in this complete timeline, you know, interact with Geiger, uh, be a part of the Unknown War, um, all, all of this stuff. Yeah, I like the seeds that they've planted here, and I want to see this guy brought into the modern day and everything. I think this is actually really interesting, and I'm, I'm really... I, I definitely suggest you guys pick this up is, is what I'm trying to say. I'm going to pick up issue two. I'm going to follow this out. I'm actually excited to read uh, Rook Exodus and, and Geiger number one now to see how they tie in. If they tie in at all, if there's any calls in there or if it's just those character origins and, and whatever. Uh, of course, you know, Geiger already has his origins, already had a whole first volume. Uh, but yeah, this is this is a good book. This is a really great start to Ghost Machine. I'm looking forward to the stuff that goes on in Ghost Machine. Looking forward to this unknown war <laughs> and seeing what happens. 
yeah, this is this is really interesting stuff. I definitely think that uh, you know if you read anything this week, you should definitely read this book. It's very interesting, very layered. Uh, so that's what I have to say about the book. That's a thumbs up for me and Bob. Definitely check that out. Add it to your pool. We're going to take a quick break and we'll return in just a moment. A battle for humanity's future is being waged on American soil right now. The cannabis plant has been used by humans for thousands of years, and yet it is still severely criminalized in much of the world. But the world is changing. Yay! In the U.S., 37 states have legalized cannabis for medical purposes, and 18 have done so for recreational use by adults. In Illinois, legalized cannabis has spurred an explosion of new businesses and products, all bringing in a massive stream of newly created revenue that other states are eager to match. Yet federally, cannabis faces much of the same resistance of the 1900s. How did marijuana get such a bad reputation? Why is it still so federally restricted? How are smoking and vaping different? How many edibles are too many? Which companies are coming out with the best new products? And who benefits from keeping Mary Jane in the dark? These are the types of questions we'll attempt to answer on the Cannabis Man podcast. A thorough look at all things cannabis, from its history to its explosion in states that have legalized it. So look out for the Cannabis Man podcast, coming soon wherever you get your podcasts. And we are back with episode number 64 of the all-new, all-different number one comics podcast. Bob, let's talk about some books that are dropping next week in local comic book shops. But before we do that, it's disclaimer time. Hey, kids, it's disclaimer time. All you kids, it's disclaimer time with Bob. Why can't you keep adding words? <laughs> I got to make a full-fledged song sooner or later, I was right? say, somebody please make a jingle. <laughs> but um, as I always say... You know, these are just a few of the comics that are coming out next week. If you want a more in-depth list of what's coming out next week, please consult elsewhere. You know, call your local comic shop. Uh, you know, Dan's favorite Harry Potter owler, owl, send him a message, smoke signal, whatever. <laughs> yeah, uh, you, you know, if you can get a Harry Potter owl to go to your local comic book shop, I seriously... 100% think that they will tell you the synopsis of every book that's coming out. If they don't, give me their address. Because, <laughs> you know, I'd be impressed if a Harry Potter owl came to my comic book shop so and asked me for, I mean, you know, each a, title that was coming out. As a comic, as a comic <laughs> shop owner, I mean, what would you do if you just saw a random white owl show up in your shop and uh, just stay in there? I, I, I don't know, honestly. I'd be pretty damn stoked. Um yeah, good question. I guess only time will tell. Yeah. <laughs> but if you happen to live in Jacksonville, Florida, like Bob and I do, you can hit up Gotham City Comics, sorry, Gotham City Limit, <laughs> and uh, ask Ben or Jonathan what new titles are coming out. They'd be happy to send you back a Harry Potter owl of all the titles that are coming out in the next week. You really want that Harry Potter owl? <laughs> I sure as hell do. So, first up on the list from Marvel Comics, we have Ultimate X-Men number two. Yeah, I'm really excited about this one. That Ultimate X-Men number one was really fun. A really, really different take on Ultimate X-Men. And this one will have the first full appearance of May Storm. I'm excited to check this one out. I'm guessing you'll be picking that up because of the Peach Momoko cover. Oh, yeah, definitely. Well, Peach Momoko cover, writing, uh, illustration, everything. Oh, yeah. That's right. She does. She does do the writing for it. Yep, it's all on her. So second up from Image, we have Rat City number one. Bob, this one's written by friend of the show Erica Schultz. And let me point out. Uh, speaking of Erica Schultz, I actually Erica Schultz just opened a shop the other day. I don't have the URL in front of me. It's it's a little too complicated, but it's like uh, Ko Dash Phi is the name of the shop or something like that. And she's a seller on there. But she's doing these like cool little bracelets. Bob, they're like the coolest little bracelets and they're like $4 a piece. 
I bought three of them last night. <laughs> so I was really kind of stoked on it. So uh, coming soon, you'll see some Erica Schultz bracelets on these wrists. But uh, yeah, Erica Schultz has, uh, you know, she's gone down in history for being the first female creator on Spawn now, on a Spawn title. Um, and she's got her own book here. This is the first appearance of Peter uh, Karn, an ex-soldier who receives his Spawn powers from nanites in his prosthetic leg and lives in a post-war future this book sounds absolutely crazy like what the hell it's a spawn dude who's not dead he's got a prosthetic leg that's giving him like his hell spawn powers this is really cool i'm really excited to check this one out and could you call him a hell spawn anymore uh i guess not <laughs> just a spawn i guess is he even a spawn i don't know um yeah, this is cool, and knowing that Erica Schultz is the one writing it makes me really excited. So I'm excited to check this one out. So you could technically say spawn, spawn to spawn. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. That's a mouthful. Uh, sticking with DC, we have Sinister Sons number three. Bob, the first appearance of Spaceman Joe. I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> I'm guessing he's a spaceman and his name is Joe. Maybe. Uh, we have Action Comics number 1064. Yes, the volume that won't die. That's right. Um, they're only... Look, see, we're catching up. They're on 1064. We're on 64. We're only 1,000 1, behind. episodes behind. Yeah, yeah hey. Uh, sooner or later, we'll be there, <laughs> Bob. Don't worry. Uh, this one introduces the House of Brainiac story, uh, part one, and an introduction of an army of something uh zarnians there you go lobo's race so. <laughs> yes yes which which it, it's cute because he started out he killed all the zarnians mm -hmm. and then you know there's an army of zarnians so <laughs> yeah lobo's had a lot a lot of retconning over the years yeah, well it's lobo what do you expect this is true uh finally from marvel we have volume four of edge of spider verse number three this one's got the first appearance of Star Spider. So we have Sp Star Spider and we have Spaceman Joe. Oh, yeah. Uh, lots and lots of uh, fun, weird things happening this mm -hmm. week for all you guys. Uh, and speaking of fun things happening this week, Bob, brought to you by the lovely Wheel of Names.com. Still not sponsored by, but coming soon. Don't worry. Uh, we've got three books on the list here that are contenders for us to cover next week. Uh, on the list, we have Rat City. Uncanny Valley and Monsters Are My Business, all number ones, all coming out next week. And let me point out, all number ones from independent publishers. No big two in here. They've got no new number ones coming Is out that next a week. For us? Yeah, I, I think so. I don't. I mean, maybe it's happened before, but it doesn't happen often if, if it has. So uh, I'm gonna spin the wheel here, and we're gonna see where it lands. Bob, any predictions? Anywhere you want it to land? Uh, what are we covering uh, next week? I kind of want Rat City. Bob, it looks like we are covering. We're so we're covering Uncanny Valley. Okay. So another okay. Tony Flex book. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we're back on the Tony Flex train. Um, yeah, I, I I'm with you. Uh, Rat City would have been a great get. I'm still definitely picking up my copy uh, and reading it. But yeah, but I mean, there's nothing wrong with the Tony Flex book. No, absolutely not. Uh, so that's what we'll be covering next week. But until then, thank you guys so much for checking us out. As always, check us out on social media. You can hit us up on Instagram at ANAD underscore number one comics podcast, on X at ANAD and O comic pod, and on TikTok at ANAD number one comics pod. You can check us out on YouTube under the comic book channel as well. Uh, this and every single week, we like to do a giveaway where we give away a copy of the book that we just covered. All you got to do is use our hashtag, all new, all different nation on social media post of your choice to be entered in the giveaway. And Bob will gladly pay for your postage. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We'll see you for episode number 65. Number 65 is alive. <laughs>